Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this Red Gaming Tech dot com video, we're going to be discussing and analysing tech news, which as usual has popped up in the past 24 or so hours. I hope you've all have been having an amazing Christmas. I'm not on camera for this video because uh, time is a little bit tight because I have some plans later on due to the uh, festive uh, season. But there are several interesting stories which have emerged actually over the past few days, and one of which concerns Intel's Tiger Link. So Tiger Lake is not new, we've known about it for some time, thanks to both leaks as well as Intel's own official roadmaps. But there is actually some really good news on the horizon for both Intel and potentially for consumers as well, and it actually concerns Intel's 10NM process. Despite the fact that Intel's 10NM process has been synonymous with doom and gloom, it looks like there is light on the horizon. Allow me to fill you in. So... As we know, Ice Lake and the 10NM process have had a couple of problems. The first is that the yields have not been yielding the results that Intel have hoped for. Did you see what I did there? It was subtle, so I just wanted to point it out. The second issue is the clock frequency has been somewhat lackluster. To give you an example, the 1065G7, which is an Ice Lake SKU, it's a single core turbo of just 3.9 gigahertz and an all core turbo of 3.5 gigahertz, which is not awful, but it's not enough to make up for the 5 gigahertz or what have you clock speed that Skylake has been hitting, despite the fact that uh, Skylake obviously has a way lower IPC. So basically, 10NM for Intel has had kind of a double whammy, and there have been numerous delays with. Uh, 10NM, which I won't go into in this video because they've been extremely well documented. Anyway, what is interesting is that Tiger Lakes um, recently had an engineering sample that has been leaked. Kamachi on Twitter has discovered this, and it runs at 4 GHz for all core turbo, and the single core turbo is 4.3 GHz. Now, I grant you, it's still below what the Comet Lake processors for mobile are hitting. 4.9-ish gigahertz, depending obviously on the SKU, but it is a noticeable improvement compared to Ice Link. And also, it's worth noting that this is an engineering sample, so potentially we could have higher clock frequency. So what gives? Why is there this sharp improvement? Well, most likely, it's because Tiger Link is being built on the 10NM++ process. Insert your memes in the comments down below, please. This is compared to Ice Lake, which was using the 10NM++ variant of the manufacturing process. This is actually a really good sign for Intel that I'm not saying 10NM++ is going to be the cure-all for everything for Intel, but at least it indicates that they are fixing the issue. Clearly for desktop, this is not really a big deal because we're going to be stuck on 14NM for a while. As many of you know, Rocket Lake is allegedly going to be a backport of Willow Cove, aka Tiger Lake, albeit on the 14NM process but sticking with 10 processor cores. But either way, for the mobile sector and for eventually other CPUs like, for example, oh, I don't know, servers, it will definitely be a massive improvement for Intel. And I also feel that this is going to be of benefit for us, even if you are more of an AMD fan, because obviously more pressure on AMD means they continue to be as relentless as possible. I'd also like to discuss another smaller piece of Intel news. This one, however, concerns their desktop graphics products. Credit to Tom's Hardware for this particular post. I'll link that article in, of course, the description of this video. And this basically solidifies some of the rumours that we've been hearing for Intel's DG1, which is, of course, Intel's first foray. Well, I guess technically it's Intel's second attempt at their first foray into discrete graphics. So DG1 has been known for some time to be the lower end or lowest end skew, excuse me, in the discrete graphics lineup. However, an entry on the Euro Asian Economic Union website um, actually gives us further details and insights into this particular SKU. It looks like it packs 96 execution units, which is, by the way, the same number as Tiger Link. What does this mean? 
Well, basically speaking, it looks like it's going to essentially be Tiger Lake's integrated graphics all bid on a discrete package. If you're unfamiliar with the uh, architecture of Intel's uh, graphics processors, basically each execution unit houses eight shaders, although we don't know, of course, whether this is going to continue for architectures beyond the 10NM processor, uh, sorry, graphics processors, which launch next year. Just as a quick reminder, 10NM is going to be DG1 and DG2, which are going to be aimed at gamers, although Ponte Vico launches the year after that, which is going to be 2021, if you're watching this in a couple of weeks' time. And that will be based on the 7NM process, and we believe it's going to have a quite different architecture. There have been a lot of interesting developments with Intel um, because it looks like it is based on XC's LP architecture. And from what we gather from Linux patches anyway, Intel seem to be wanting to, uh, I guess, almost kind of do Crossfire slash SLI with the uh, discrete graphics as well as the iGPU, which is inside of their current CPUs. I actually covered this back in October with a video, but basically we've seen Linux patches which allow these two uh, GPUs to work together, although it's extremely early days and whether this A works for Windows and B, whether this is, well, any help to gamers, your guess is as good as mine. We have precious few details of what Intel are actually planning for DG1 slash 2. Uh, from what I'm hearing, it looks like DG1 is going to be a 25 watt part at maximum, although there are some reports, and I'm hearing it as well, the DG1 is having some issues maintaining the power envelope. And there is also some reason to believe, because of Raja Kadora's number plate, believe it or not, or license plate, if you prefer, on his vehicle, which seems to indicate that there's going to be something happening in June of 2020, which would potentially be either a lot more details of the uh, GPUs or potentially actually the launch of the cards. I am hearing... That with DG1 anyway, Intel are basically going to be charging a few bucks for the uh, GPU. I'm of course being a little bit uh, silly there, but I'm essentially saying that they're going to charge the least amount of money possible. This is in an effort to offer a solution for folks who just need a very basic graphics card. And also you could presumably say that it's going to be one of those weird scenarios where you could potentially have, like, let's say, a Ryzen 9 3950 or 3900 and pair it with an Intel GPU. So, for example, if you just need lots of CPU grunt but you don't need a whole lot of GPU grunt, this might be a good option for you. And also could potentially add some pressure to the market in the lower end SKUs. There is also a lot of conflicting information at the moment of how well both DG1 and DG2 are uh, progressing. I'm hearing from multiple different people that DG2 is allegedly targeting RTX 2070-2080 performance. There is some confusion between the two. I also covered this recently in a video. However, uh, while that is not particularly impressive for a card which launches next year, let's say mid to late next year you need to take it in the context that Intel allegedly will be launching this at a very cheap price. As always, I would say don't pre-order anything and keep your hype to at least a manageable level and let's see what the benchmarks are when this card launches. I am, however, still happy that Intel are entering the discrete GPU market because ultimately it is going to just be a third player. And quite frankly, I think we need more competition. And I'm also really excited at CES next year because uh, we should, theoretically, see a lot more detail from AMD and their RDNA second generation as well. The final thing I'd like to cover for today regards NVIDIA and their RTX GPUs. Because according to Jensen Huang, who is, of course, the big boss over at NVIDIA, plus, of course, NVIDIA themselves. The RTX 2080, which you can find in laptops, they use the Lenovo Y740 as an example. The RTX 2080 inside of that is actually faster than the next-generation systems. 
uh, film, although they were very cagey on whether this meant both Sony and Microsoft's console, or exactly what they were referring to, because the rumour has it, of course, that Microsoft are going to be launching two different SKUs. If you missed that information, uh, we know, of course, of the Xbox Series X, which is rumoured to be about 12 teaflops, but there is also rumoured to be the Xbox Series S, which is allegedly going to be around a 4-ish teaflop target. In the very same slide, NVIDIA were also comparing it against the Lenovo Y900, uh, which was based on a GTX 980M, whereas the RTX 2080 is using a Max-Q design. Basically, these GPUs are specifically developed for laptops and aim to offer an increased level of performance, but also maintain a lower power consumption. And obviously, this has benefits with laptops. A, they have slimmer form factors, so cooling is obviously a concern. And secondly... Well, it's a laptop, so battery life is obviously quite important, as well as portability. I have several thoughts, actually, regarding this, and I'm probably going to break this down to a separate video soon, because I actually want to really go into the whole cost of GPUs and the concerns I have given the next-generation consoles. I, I've been meaning to do it for some time, but I've just been so busy over the last uh, week or two, what, with Christmas, plus, of course, getting a review of the GTX 1660 uh, super up as well as working on several analysis videos for the next generation console plus a couple of other things I just haven't had time to really kind of think about my thoughts and solidify them into any semblance of a script however I do have a couple of things I'd like to kind of uh, dive into in this video the first of which is that well the cost um, let's take worst case scenarios for the next generation consoles and say that the PS5, as well as the next generation Xbox, cost, mm, let's say, 500 US dollars. I'm not saying it will cost that much. I have a feeling the PS5 is going to be more like 399 but let's use worst case scenarios here. The thing is, a Max Q laptop is going to cost you like 1500 to 2000 bucks. obviously depending on how you want to configure the rest of the system. Now, I'm not saying that one is a better value than the other. I'm merely pointing out that for an RTX 2080 on the desktop, you are actually looking at more money than a console itself. So it's kind of like, well, yeah, okay, even if the performance of an RTX 2080 is better than, greater than the next generation console, and once again, NVIDIA are not really giving specifics on how. Are they referring to ray tracing performance? Are they referring to the entire performance of the system as a whole? Are they referring to a single console and also how much do they know about the next generation consoles as well like are they just referring to let's say the base model xbox which is once again four t-flops or are they comparing it against the xbox series x which would mean it's a lot more impressive i do suspect that the next generation consoles are going to be quite beastly and they will also be instrumental in changing how games are developed I discussed this more at length recently in my Xbox Series X analysis video, uh, but basically, even if you look at how a developer codes a game with, let's say, the SSD in mind, it's not just going to be like, oh, an SSD reduces load times, but also, implicitly, it's going to change how a game is designed. It's going to drastically change what is possible in a game, because if you're developing... Uh, a title with an SSD in mind, you don't have to worry about things like the infamous elevators in Mass Effect, for example. And that obviously means you could craft a lot larger, more open worlds. PCs have really had the benefit of SSDs for a long, long time. And NVMe drives are just, well, dime a dozen now. You can get, like, a reasonably sized one for, like, between 100 to 150 US dollars, which is going to offer ridiculous read and write speeds, like, way over 3,000 megabytes per second. Unfortunately, the sluggish, to be quite honest with you, drives inside the current generation consoles is just not capable of taking advantage of this. Even if you were to replace let's say the PS4's drive with, let's say, an SSD. If you're using a base model console from when the system launched, it only has a SATA tooth interface anyway. Furthermore, the games just were not coded to take advantage of it. 
So I, I'm really looking forward to the next generation consoles, not only for what they are capable of doing for themselves, but also it's going to give PC gaming a nice shot in the arm, and I don't feel the technology is going to be so nerfed for PC, and it's going to be really interesting to see what happens with, let's say, ray tracing and all of these other technologies which are being developed for console. With all of that said, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. If you did, then, well, the normal stuff. Like, share, comment, and subscribe. I'd also like to once again wish you all a Merry Christmas and spend a moment to thank you all for all of the Christmas wishes. Several people have emailed me and lots of comments, uh, Facebook messages, and so on and so on. So I'd like to thank you all for that. Furthermore, I'd like to thank all of the recent new subscribers. It's been... Uh, quite humbling to be honest with all the positive reception we've been getting for some of our videos recently so I wish you all a Merry Christmas and thank you again for all of the support but with all of that said have an amazing day take care of yourselves and bye for now